I'm going to hand it over to Paula. Thank you for being with us and please remain muted during the presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Julianne, and welcome everyone uh, to our final talk in our series on artificial intelligence. Uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, and today's speaker is Dr. Duncan Purvis, who is an associate professor in the philosophy department at the University of Florida. His specialty is ethics, um, especially ethical issues concerning artificial intelligence and the treatment of non human animals. His past work focused on ethical issues related to so-called autonomous weapon systems, which are, as we learned a few weeks ago, are weapons that can target enemies without human oversight. Uh, Dr. Purvis currently is funded by NSF to investigate the ethical dimensions of predictive policing algorithms, which are being used to identify places and people at highest risk of crime. Some of the ethical concerns he is looking at include discriminatory impacts and community distrust. He also has worked on theoretical issues related to the nature and normative significance of harm. Dr. Purvis received his BS in philosophy and BA in French from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and PhD in philosophy from the University of Colorado, Boulder. And today he's going to be talking to us about the ethical considerations associated with artificial intelligence and predictive policing. So uh, welcome, Dr. Purvis. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, this is uh, one of the larger audiences I've had for a talk. So uh, this is pretty impressive and uh, mildly intimidating. But um, I also suspect that many in this audience are uh, sharper and more accomplished than I am. So that's also a, a little bit intimidating. Um, but um, I'm, I hope that uh, some of what I have to say today is new to some of you. Um, and uh, at least part of it is interesting uh, to some of you. I'll be doing a little bit of, I'll be talking a little bit about criminology um, and a little bit about um, artificial intelligence and a little bit about ethics. So that's kind of a in, very interdisciplinary talk in that way. So um, <clears throat> as Paula said, uh, the presentation I'm about to give is part of a larger NSF uh, funded project studying the ethical implications of using data-driven systems in policing. Um, uh, I, when I talk about data-driven systems, I mean to include um, at least license plate readers facial recognition technology, and uh, person-based criminal risk assessment systems. Um, but the technology I'm going to focus on today is what is commonly called place-based predictive policing, which involves using algorithmic systems to identify places that are at the highest risk of crime. So to begin, um, let me just say a bit about the system. So. So these days, many police officers across the United States start their shifts by consulting a crime forecast generated by a program called PredPol. PredPol has become the most widely used predictive policing software in the United States, uh, beginning early, uh, well, not this decade, since we are early this decade, but last decade, around 2010, uh, LAPD, the, L the Los Angeles Police Department began using PredPol to generate heat maps of 500 by 500 square foot boxes, which are displayed on a tablet in an officer's patrol car, indicating high risk areas for motor vehicle theft and burglary or theft from a vehicle. Um, Hunch Lab is another system that some police departments use. Um, uh, so a machine learning algorithm trained on vast troves of crime data and, uh, collected over the course of the 20th and 21st century, PredPol generates forecasts by analyzing information about type, location, and type of crime, uh, and time of crime. Um, Hunch Lab uses more variables than PredPol, um, but I was gonna, I'm going to focus on PredPol in this talk. Um, additional data from recent crime reports can be incorporated daily to update the program's forecasts. And the purpose of directing officers to these 500 by 500 square foot boxes is as much to be seen as it is to see. The idea here is that police can deter crime merely by being more visible in high-risk areas at high-risk times of day. 
So in 2018, uh, LAPD officers spent a total of uh, close to 30,000 hours in these high-risk boxes. Dozens of police departments across the country have used or are currently using PredPol. Um, interestingly, it's worth noting that the LAPD actually very recently stopped using the PredPol software uh, in, a, in the spring of 2021, ostensibly for budgetary reasons, but as you may have uh, seen in the news, they also received a lot of public backlash um, for the use of that system, and that might have played a role in their decision to change tack there. So predictive policing is controversial. In 2016, the ACLU, along with 16 other civil rights, technology, and philanthropic organizations issued a statement listing some of the civil rights concerns associated with predictive policing. Commentary has been published in uh, journals like Nature and elsewhere, raising concerns about bias against communities of color, um, which I'm going to discuss in significant detail below. Most commonly, the concern about bias amounts to the claim that predictive policing algorithms rely on racially biased data in generating and updating their crime forecasts, and so they're biased against communities of color. Um, now, this concern about bias calls into question their effectiveness, but also their fairness um, in the distribution of, of policing burdens. So um, in this paper, I want to suggest that by focusing on, on bias, Opponents of predictive policing seem to concede that if racial bias could be eliminated from these systems, there would be no serious objection to using predictive policing software. Now, I want to propose that um, in addition to asking whether predictive policing is biased, which I think we should be asking, we should also be asking whether it is unfair, where that's a separate question. Now, bias and fairness may seem to be inextricably linked. They might be concepts that seem deeply connected, but I wanna to try to show that they can come apart. So even when it is accurate, predictive policing might be in some way unfair by causing the burdens of policing to fall unequally on innocent members of minority communities. Um, and just to be clear, to put my cards on the table, I'm not, um, uh, an activist about this stuff. Um, I am an academic, so I don't, I'm not anti, uh, I don't take a kind of hard anti predictive policing or data analytics position, um, but I am an ethicist. And so I think it's worth surveying and addressing the kinds of ethical concerns that arise for the deployment of these technologies. So in closing, if I have time, I wanna suggest a way forward for the use of predictive policing. Um, I wanna suggest that police departments can start to address concerns about unfairness by adopting uh, what are sometimes called uh, problem-based or, commu uh, or community policing methods whenever feasible. Um, and uh, I'm going to suggest at the end here that addressing the charge of unfairness will require building trust um, within targeted communities. So let me say a bit about the case for predictive policing before we talk about the critiques. So the strongest case for predictive policing is its efficiency. If predictive policing improves an agency's, a police agency's ability to deter and apprehend offenders of violent crime or property crime, then this seems like a good reason for police to use it, right? So the potential of predictive policing to aid police in the apprehension and deterrence of criminals is supported by a long held tenet of criminology that crime is connected to place. So hotspots policing, um, it, which, uh, sort of began to um, become in vogue, to come in vogue in the 80s and early 90s is founded on the discovery by criminologists that typically very small geographic areas within a city are responsible for a majority of all criminal activity. So research suggests that the vast majority of certain types of crime is, is concentrated in very small places. Crime is concentrated not only in particular neighborhoods, but even within particular blocks or groups of blocks within those neighborhoods. So hotspots policing acknowledges this, um, this place-based feature of crime by focusing police efforts on geographic areas that are much smaller than the geographic units used in traditional police policing, um, like neighborhoods. Now there's been uh, evidence for some time and sort of growing evidence over the past three decades showing that hotspots policing programs generate at the very least modest crime control gains 
and they're likely to produce a diffusion of crime control benefits into the areas immediately surrounding the targeted high activity crime places. So when you, when you uh, focus police efforts in the small high crime areas, um, you do get crime control benefits in those areas, but also those benefits extend out a little bit beyond immediately where the police are focusing their attention. Um, now, it's important not to oversell the efficacy of hotspots policing. Um, usually, uh, when you focus police uh, resources in a hotspot, you do see a reduction of crime um, in that area, but it's a very short-term reduction. So it really only lasts uh, between one and three weeks. So it, it, you end up having to sort of continually right, supply policing resources to the area to um, see those crime reduction benefits. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some things that police departments can do that might have longer term, um, longer term benefits in crime reduction. Um, so um, now predictive policing can be thought of as a technologically assisted extension of hotspots policing. So the reality of policing is that resources are limited, okay? And police departments are facing um, uh, more limited resources in a lot of places now than they did before. Um, budget, police budgets are being restricted um, in, in um, precincts across the, across the nation. So when facing budget cuts or difficulty in recruiting uh, candidates, which a lot of departments are having trouble with right now, um, especially given the heightened scrutiny of policing uh, with respect to um, civil rights abuses, um, police understandably look for a way to do more with less, right? And predictive policing does the job of human crime analysts um, uh, um, I will take, oh, would you like me to take questions from the chat uh, now or at the end? I can do either one. Yeah, I think, that, well, I suppose that's up to you. Um, I, I think it's more efficient if we can hold questions to the end, um, yeah. if that works that's, for you. That's totally fine. And please okay. feel free to just enter questions as they occur to you. I'll just address them at the end, if, if okay. that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so, Predictive policing, there's some evidence that predictive policing is, um, is more effective uh, than human crime analysts and, and cheaper. So for example, one study shows that PredPol is twice as accurate as human crime analysts in, in anticipating criminal activity. Um, and an annual subscription to the PredPol software is significantly less than the salary of one additional crime analyst. Um, I haven't checked the recent numbers, but uh, my understanding is that it is between uh, ten and twenty thousand dollars a year, um, in which is uh, well, uh, hopefully cheaper than the salary of a human crime analyst. Um, but also, uh, the LAPD I, it was was using the software free of charge for a significant period of time. Okay, um, so now. Now, as I said before, predictive policing harnesses vast troves of crime data amassed over the course of the 20th century to anticipate future crime, rather than merely to respond to past or ongoing criminal activity. Um, so uh, crime data are added daily to generate predictions for each uh, officer's shift. Different types of crime in different places can be targeted throughout the day using various tactics. Now, when it's successful, predictive policing allows police to be close to the places where crime is likeliest to occur, and the algorithm is less susceptible than human crime analysts to potentially biased hunches or intuitions about where crime is likely to occur. The thinking here is that the numbers don't lie, right? Now, um, the empirical literature on predictive policing is mixed, um, but some studies indicate that there is there is reason to have optimism about its potential. So a recent predictive policing project in Atlantic City um, found a significant decrease in violent crime and property crime. So in this project, uh, what are called risk terrain maps were used by the Atlantic City Police Department to show the locations that had special spatial vulnerabilities to crime. Um, so the Atlantic City PD targeted high-risk places with extra police presence, but also local civic organizations and city government 
targeted priority areas with security improvements. Um, for example, um, one spatial vulnerability to crime uh, is um, any area of, of the city that has uh, very dim street lighting, to take a simple example. So uh, one way to reduce the probability um, of a mugging or something like that is simply to reduce dimmer halogen street lights with LEDs. Um, another spatial vulnerability to crime that a lot of high risk places have is a lot of abandoned properties. So um, uh, the city government took the lead on um, demolishing 17 abandoned properties located in the high risk areas in the study. And even though the high risk areas, which are shown on this, uh, this map uh, on the, the slide here, well, they constituted a very small percent of Atlantic City's overall land area, right? One, one percent of the overall area. But researchers found that targeting these areas correlated with a decline in crime in Atlantic City of 36% in 2017 compared with 2016. Okay, so um, they saw what they, what they said were immediate, um, immediate improvements. Now, turning to the less rosy part of this presentation, um, a lot of critics on the other, uh, however, including civil rights organizations and best-selling authors like Kathy O'Neill um, have argued that predictive, uh, predictive policing algorithms rely on racially biased data. And so they cannot be trusted as tools for crime reduction. Um, these critics argue that using these systems can lead to a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy to the detriment of minority communities. So the fundamental problem, these critics suggest, is that arrest data is biased data. So arrest data is biased in the sense that it is driven by historical racial bias on the part of police officers. Historically, the argument goes, police have over, police have over-policed black communities. If that's true, then we should expect arrest data to be skewed by this over-policing in such a way that crime data or arrest data over-represents crime in black communities. Therefore, if predictive policing forecasts are based on arrest data, they will simply reflect and reinforce historical bias, um, historically biased policing practices against communities of color. So the thought is this, a predictive policing algorithm that's trained on biased arrest data will recommend putting more police in communities of color. But of course, once there are more police in a community, this will yield more arrests, which will be used as a proxy for higher crime rates, which are then used to justify greater police presence in that community. And on and on we go, right? It's a kind of vicious cycle uh, or self-fulfilling prophecy. But if this is the way that predictive policing works, it's clearly an irrational way to proceed. So as uh, philosopher Casper Lippert Rasmussen has put the point, and I got the quote here on the slide, to the extent that a certain statistical fact is the causal result of a certain policy of differential treatment, that policy cannot be justified by appealing to this statistical fact. And that, the worry goes, is what's going on with predictive policing. So if predictive policing has the result that officers are targeting communities of color out of proportion to the actual rate of criminal activity in those communities, then predictive policing results in an ineffective use of policing resources, right? But by allocating too many police in black neighborhoods or minority neighborhoods, predictive policing simultaneously seems to impose an unequal and unfair burden um, of policing on members of those communities. Now, that's the argument, that's the kind of, that's the big criticism um, uh, that we see in a lot of popular media and, uh, um, and in books like Kathy O'Neill's uh, book, Weapons of Math Destruction, um, which if you haven't read it, is a great introduction to a lot of these issues. Um, um, so, right, so when we talk about an unequal burden um, or an unfair burden being placed on um, members of black communities by predictive policing, what are we talking about, right? Well, predictive policing of the sort I'm talking about targets places, not people, right? 
it targets individuals. So um, uh, it doesn't target individuals, right? So it's not like racial profiling in that way, right? Um, racial profiling targets particular people on the basis of their racial membership. But even though predictive policing targets places, not people, individuals who live in designated high risk areas will by default end up receiving more police attention, right? They're there. <laughs> um, so they're therefore more likely to interact with police via stops, searches, seizures, or arrests than people who live or work elsewhere. And increased police contact in an area also increases the probability of mistaken searches, seizures, arrests, or, con or even in some cases convictions of innocent people. And of course, you know, as we've seen in, in some, prominent, um, some prominent cases around the United States in the past, uh, well, couple decades, but especially the past couple years, there are um, risks of physical harm, right? Whenever a citizen comes into contact um, with police, in the extreme case, an innocent person may be killed if mistaken for an armed offender resisting arrest. Now, some evidence suggests that black Americans are already three to three and a half times more likely than white Americans to be the victims of a police shooting. So when there are more police in an area, especially when the area is designated high risk for say homicide or armed robbery, common sense tells us that people in that area are more likely to have um, a harmful interaction with police. Thus, predictive policing, the story goes, leads to an inefficient or ineffective and also unfair burden of policing on minority communities. Okay, so that's the story. Now, here's, here's the thing. Um, I ultimately think that it is a mistake for opponents of predictive policing to hitch their case to this self-fulfilling prophecy problem. Because it's not clear that uh, cleaning up the data um, would establish that crime is in fact evenly distributed along or across racial lines, right? Um, so um, in fact, it's not even clear that the data that some predictive policing systems use is susceptible to a self-fulfilling prophecy of the sort that I just described. So um, take for instance, the, the LAPD's experiment with predictive policing. The LAPD, so um, PredPol ignores arrest data, does not use arrest data, and it focuses instead on reported crime. So um, Officer Sean Malinkowski of the LAPD, who was involved in implementing the PredPol predictive policing experiment, was quoted as saying this, we stress that this strategy, the strategy of using the PredPol system, develops and plots crime forecasts based on a three-year look at crime patterns and that arrests are not part of the equation. In our model, we would hope to deploy officers based on crime only. Okay, so, so one way, as I suggested, to use crime data without using arrest data is to use crime reports. So these are uh, reports um, that are uh, generated from say emergency calls for service from uh, communities. They could also be, um, uh, they'll also be uh, written up when an officer is called to the scene of a crime. Um, uh, so when a car is stolen and the crime is reported by the victim, this report is not the result of police looking for crime in an area, right? Um, crime reports and emergency calls for service are typically initiated by members of the community. And so they're more likely to reflect an actual crime occurrence. Whereas arrests very often only uh, reflect discovered crime or the suspicion of crime by officers. Um, and here's the thing, it does not appear that data from crime reports or emergency calls for service lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy problem. Okay. Uh, in fact, oops, you might think that if the police are doing their job and they're being effective, that crime reports would drop over time rather than increase um, um, in an area. So now here's the thing. If predictive policing systems use crime reports, which are generated by the community, instead of arrest data that's generated by police officers looking for crime, 
it becomes much more difficult to argue that predictive policing is biased against Black Americans. And this is because crime data generated from community, community crime reports might actually underestimate the amount of time, of the amount of some types of crime in minority communities. Um, now, I, this is a very speculative suggestion. So I, you know, uh, I, uh, you can take it with a grain of salt, but I think there's, it's, there's some evidence for this. So a recent Cato Institute survey, um, which you can just, uh, you, can, you can find right there uh, on the internet through Google, uh, found that while 78% of white Americans say they would definitely report a violent crime that they witnessed, only 54% of African Americans and 57% of Hispanics were that confident. Um, so what that suggests is that when it comes to uh, reported crime, numbers in minority communities might actually be deflated compared with white communities because of the kind of um, hesitance that members of minority communities have to report crimes to police. So in the end, it could just turn out that reliable crime statistics establish that some crimes do cluster in minority communities. And this would not be an entirely surprising result insofar as other drivers of crime like poverty or low educational attainment correlate with race in places like the United States. It's a sort of sad fact of uh, life here. Um, and so as a legal scholar, uh, Andrew Ferguson has written in his excellent book, which I recommend reading called uh, uh, Big Data Policing, he writes this, the predicted boxes of heightened gun violence may correlate with poor communities of color, but that is also where the shootings happen. The bias lies not in the algorithm, but in the real world facts going into the system. So if this turns out to be true, then predictive policing would seem to be vindicated as a kind of unbiased and efficient crime fighting tool. Okay. Now, okay, so much for the self-fulfilling prophecy problem. Now, I actually think that the self-fulfilling prophecy problem might be a red herring, and it could be in some ways distracting us from a larger, more important conversation about fairness and policing. The problem is the argument relies too heavily on statistical claims that may or may not turn out to be true. Instead, I wanna suggest that a full ethical evaluation of predictive policing needs to begin with the observation that policing involves imposing burdens on people, on some people for the sake of, an, of aggregate social benefits in the form of crime reduction. So that is, Policing, because it's coercive, because it imposes a risk of harm on some innocent people, um, uh, it in some sense burdens some for the sake of benefiting others, that is for an aggregate gain in safety. And I think once we appreciate this fact, we can then ask whether it's fair or the conditions under which it is fair to burden some members of a community for the sake of um, aggregate gains in safety. And when we ask this question, I think we see that predictive policing might be unfair, even when it's not based on racially biased data. Um, so a powerful objection to, uh, so I wanna briefly look at racial profiling and some of the problems that people raise for racial profile, the, the moral objections that people raise to racial profiling. So a powerful objection to racial profiling is simply that it results in an unfair burden of law enforcement being placed on innocent minorities for the sake of promoting safety uh, in, the, in the aggregate. So for example, if police use race as a factor when making traffic stops or when deciding how thoroughly to investigate someone that they do stop, then innocent black motorists will suffer a disproportionate burden of policing, right? That is a disproportionate number of black motorists, um, of innocent black motorists or guilty of no crime will receive more scrutiny than, they, uh, than their behavior um, warrants. And yet the objection goes, the benefits of crime reduction will be roughly evenly distributed through society. So you've got innocent black Americans suffering more burdens of policing through stops, searches, seizures, and arrests. Um, and the benefits that accrue as a result of that practice are gonna be distributed sort of roughly evenly. So they don't get their fair, their fair share of the benefits. 
Now, it's commonly accepted that it's unfair to harm innocent people for the sake of benefiting others. So um, racial profiling is unfair, even when it's effective at reducing crime. Now, there are other problems that people raise for racial profiling, that's just, just one. Now, I think a similar worry can be raised for predictive policing. When predictive policing places extra police patrols in low-income communities of color, it again, as I've already said, raises the probability that innocent members of those communities will have a harmful encounter with police. And for reasons discussed above, innocent people in those communities will then be disproportionately burdened for the sake of crime benefits that are enjoyed by others. And this is unfair. I think this is a legitimate moral concern with both racial profiling and predictive policing. And just to make this example concrete, so I live on, I live on the very eastern edge of the duck pond. All right. Um, how many of us, sorry, how many people in this room live in Gainesville? Everybody? Is this, or are you guys all over? I don't even know where everyone is. Yeah, I think we're fairly concentrated in Gainesville, but I, I can't speak for everyone. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so, but, um, so many of us know what the duck pond neighborhood is. Um, right, so then, um, so if, if predictive policing recommends putting uh, the majority of police patrols um, on the very far east side of Gainesville, right, um, where, uh, um, that are predominantly black, right? Um, now, be, I live, pretty close to there. I live just east of 7th, okay, um, in the very far east edge of the duck pond. So as we saw um, when the discussion of hotspots policing, crime reduction benefits kind of radiate out from the place where police attention is targeted, right? So if police focus a lot of their time, a bunch of their extra time in um, uh, on the very east, uh, east end of Gainesville um, in black communities, I'm going to enjoy the crime reduction benefits of that extra attention. But they're not looking in my neighborhood. They're not, they're not coming to my street per se. And so I don't bear the risk, the additional risk of being mistakenly stopped or searched or arrested, right? Um, because they're not looking directly where I am, right? They're looking just adjacent. So I get the benefits, but without having to sort of deal with the risks. And so the thought is um, members of black communities might be disproportionately burdened for the sake of crime benefits that are enjoyed by me and other people. And this is unfair. Now, I think this is a legitimate moral concern with both racial profiling and predictive policing. But notice that this concern emphasizes only the burdens of policing, okay? What if predictive policing unequally benefits the very same people that it unequally burdens? Would it then still be unfair? So in defense of racial profiling, um, uh, German philosopher Matthias Rissa and American economist Richard Zeckhauser uh, have written this. Uh, and this, this is on the slide here, this quote, the italicized uh, block of text. They say, we submit that a sufficient condition for imposing unequal burdens is that those burdened are burdened more are net beneficiaries from that public good whose supply depends on their unequal burden. If the unequal imposition of a burden is counterbalanced by a net benefit that the relevant group gains, the unequal burden is not undue. And philosopher David Boonin writes, if a practice disproportionately benefits Black Americans, then it's not clear why it would be unfair for it to also disproportionately burden them. And so there are indeed um, some reasons to think that Black Americans do benefit disproportionately from violent crime reduction, for example. So in 2015, of the 13,455 homicide cases, in which the FBI listed a victim's racial information, 52.3% of the victims were black. More than half, right, of all homicide victims in the United States in 2015 were black. Only 43.5% were white. Now these statistics, these statistics are pretty remarkable uh, considering that uh, blacks comprise just 13.3% of the US population, whereas whites constitute 77.1%. 
So the thought here is while predictive policing burdens innocent black Americans unequally by increasing police presence in black communities, it might also unequally benefit black Americans by reducing crime and promoting security disproportionately in those communities. And because dis predictive policing disproportionately benefits the very communities that it burdens, the reply, this reply concludes, it's not unfair. Now we're gonna get into some, some philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> so now here, I think things get even more complicated. So what I've done so far, as I've said, here's this, here's this sort of initial sort of popular argument against predictive policing, this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy problem. And then I, I suggest it's not clear to me that that self-fulfilling prophecy problem is going to really um, work out in the way that the opponents of predictive policing think it will. I then wanted to, then I sort of raised this kind of um, analogy with racial profiling. And I said, look, even if predictive policing is effective, it might be unfair because it disproportionately burdens um, black American, innocent black Americans with police attention. Then I suggest actually, as long as the benefits um, sort of the benefits for black Americans counterbalance or outweigh those burdens, it's just not, it's not clear that predictive policing is unfair to black Americans. And there's some reason to think that additional police attention in black communities does disproportionately benefit black Americans by reducing violent crime in those communities. So now I wanna suggest that even if the benefits of predictive policing significantly outweighed the burdens for members of black communities, predictive policing could still be unfair. And this is because innocent members of black communities, mm -hmm. like all communities, are entitled to have some say over the manner in which the benefits of policing are administered, especially in cases where those benefits come with significant costs. So that the thought is there is a kind of right of participation or a right to uh, a right of, of refusal to certain forms of um, of policing. Um, and I think the reason for this is simple. Notice that most of us think that we have the right to refuse medical treatment. That is, a physician is not permitted to treat us, assuming we are mentally competent, rational adults, in ways to which we have refused. Um, uh, um, so if, you know, if you have a do not resuscitate um, request, right? Um, it is a, a physician's obligation to respect that, to respect that request. Um, this suggests that we have what I will call, this is, this is a very philosopher term, something like what you might call a power of prudential exclusion. And what that means is that each of us has powers of control regarding whether and for what purposes others may use our good or our welfare. So the idea here is that someone uses another person's good when she justifies her actions by appealing to the fact that it will promote someone else's well-being. Um, so on this view, uh, reasons pertaining to an individual's good can be thought of as a kind of resource, a moral resource. And just as I could exclude you from using my body or my property by withholding my consent, I have the power to prevent you from justifying what you do by appealing to the fact that you will benefit me by doing it. So just as like, I can refuse your right to use my bicycle to go grocery shopping, right? Uh, I, can I can say, nope, you can't use that. And, they, and um, you know, even if you're doing it for good reason, right? I can uh, forbid you from doing it and you therefore have no right to do it. Similarly, I can forbid you from using my well-being to justify your actions, okay? Um, and this is kind of, this is what goes on in the case of, of refusing medical treatment, right? If I refuse medical treatment, what I'm doing is I am forbidding a physician from you, from appealing to the fact that medical treatment will benefit me from justifying the medical treatment, right? I'm sort of removing it that you can't use that. You cannot justify operating on me by appealing to the fact that it'll benefit me. Okay. Because my well being is my resource, um, my moral resource. So by exercising this power of prudential exclusion, the thought is 
I can in some way render my good or my well-being morally inadmissible for the purposes of justifying your action. And you commit a, a kind of moral trespass against me if you attempt to do that, to do otherwise. So the thought here is that um, there's a sense in which you need my consent to justify your actions by appealing to the fact that they will benefit me. And so I think that securing the consent of one's intended beneficiaries becomes especially important when defending some people, say some innocent members of minority communities, imposes a risk of harm on other innocent bystanders. And this is because it's really difficult to justify harming innocent people, okay? Um, so in a case where a defensive intervention imposes significant harms on innocent people and where beneficiaries of the intervention have refused the intervention, the intervention becomes extremely difficult to justify because if the beneficiaries of the intervention have refused consent to the intervention, the power of prudential exclusion suggests that you can no longer appeal to their benefit, to the benefits to them in order to justify your action, right? Just as the doctor can no longer appeal to the benefits to me as their patient to justify the surgery if I refuse the surgery. So then all you're left with, if the beneficiaries refuse consent to an intervention, are the harms or the risk of harm that the intervention imposes on innocent people. And this is why, say, to, so to take a sort of more ordinary, you know, real world example, this is why it becomes um, especially, uh, it can become especially difficult to justify, say, humanitarian, risky humanitarian interventions in, um, in say, um, um, tyrannical regimes if the people that you are trying to help don't want you there, <laughs> right? Especially if the risk, if the intervention imposes serious risks on innocent people, which humanitarian interventions often do, right? Um, uh, it turns out it's just very difficult uh, to kill all and only the bad guys when you intervene um, militarily. Okay, so returning to predictive policing, right? We've seen that predictive policing, like any form of policing, imposes risks unequally on innocent members of minority communities. Um, the power of prudential exclusion tells us that the benefits of predictive policing can justify the practice or justify imposing those risks only when those benefits accrue to community members who have consented. That is, only the benefits, only these benefits can be used to justify the unequal imposition of risk or imposition of harms on members of those communities. So if the benefits of predictive policing are going to outweigh the costs, they must be benefits to consenting parties, to people who welcome the intervention. So if we're worried about predictive policing, it should not be because it depends on racially biased data. Instead, we should reflect more deeply about under what circumstances it is acceptable to impose unequal risks on members of minority communities. And when we turn our attention to these deeper concerns, uh, we see that establishing the fairness of predictive policing in communities of color requires doing more than showing just that the benefits to them outweigh the costs. The thought here is that I wanna suggest is that consent matters too. Um, so the question then is, if this is right, and you know, I haven't given you some sort of deductive definitive argument. This is sort of more suggestive. It's more something to think about or explore. So the question then is, have members of black communities validly refused consent to, pred to predictive policing algorithms? That is, have, um, have, black, have members of black communities sort of said, no thanks, we don't want those, we don't want those risks. Uh, we, don't, we don't think they're worth it. Now, I think in many cases, I'm not sure they've been asked. I'm not sure that they've been asked for their consent. And there is plenty of evidence that many Black Americans are less than enthusiastic than other demographics about extra police attention, regardless of where it comes from. So African Americans are, you know, I mean, so um, 
I'm not going to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, but I think that that, that movement and a lot of the um, sort of recent public outcry about um, uh, violence against uh, Black Americans by police is reflective of a kind of general skepticism or lack of trust in police by uh, Black Americans. So African Americans are about twice as likely as white Americans to know someone who's been physically abused by police. 39% of Black Americans know someone who's been physically mistreated by police. 56% of Black Americans say that police tactics are too harsh. Whereas, uh, um, and only 40% of Black Americans have a favorable attitude toward police. 11% have a very unfavorable attitude toward police. So this is just, I mean, this is just a little bit of evidence, but it's just some thought that it's not just a given <laughs> that the average member of a predominantly black community is going to welcome the additional attention that comes from using predictive policing software. So, um, oops, ah, I don't want to end my slideshow. Ah, sorry. Let me try this again. Mishap. We're so close. Um, of course, it happens right there at the end. All right, back. Um, so, so the question then is, the, the sort of moral question then is, what do we do about securing consent? What do we do about getting an endorsement for a policing practice in, in a community that is um, most likely to receive the greatest burden of that practice, but also the greatest benefits? So to secure consent, I wanna suggest that police must first make a convincing case that they are on the side of targeted communities. So one way to do this is by targeting serious offenses like property crime and violent crime, rather than minor offenses like marijuana possession, which most, many, many people just don't care about, okay? And this can be, and so, and another way to do it is by involving the community in the deliberative process. So for example, in the course of the Atlantic City Police Department initiative that I talked about at the outset, um, Atlantic City police officers met with city officials and community leaders on several occasions to discuss the next steps in the, in the project, right? Um, uh, and I, um, about a year ago, joined the, um, uh, the Gainesville Police Advisory Council, um, which is a body that was um, put into place by the city commission to um, work with and collaborate with the Gainesville Police Department to sort of give the citizens of Gainesville more input, more say, and more information about what it is the Gainesville PD um, are up to. And so we meet every month with the Gainesville Police, with the Chief of Police, right, Chief Jones. He gives us an update on the state of things. He talks about the initiatives they're working on. Um, he talks about um, the things they're most concerned about in the community, what types of crimes they're looking at. And he asks us for, for input, for feedback. Um, one of the things that has come up in our conversations is that Gainesville police have in recent years made a much more effort, a much more targeted effort to meet with members, with sort of leaders of individual communities to talk about what sorts of crime interventions are likely to be successful in those communities. So they've actually worked quite hard to, um, this is my impression, they've actually worked quite hard to sort of get more feedback and get more buy-in and endorsement from uh, uh, not just members of the city commission, but actual leaders of particular neighborhoods, actual um, you know, leading lights in individual communities. Um, now, um, uh, the Gainesville police have also taken steps to reduce minority youth contact with police. Um, by instructing officers about alternatives to arrest for minor infractions by young people, um, and even by mandating the issuance of civil citations for first time misdemeanor offenders. So um, if someone is, is caught for a misdemeanor offense um, during say a traffic stop, they might, um, instead of being arrested, which was the sort of standard protocol uh, not that long ago, um, it, is a, it is an officer's uh, prerogative um, to issue just a civil citation to go to court. Nobody goes in the back of a cop car, nobody's fingerprinted, nobody's taken to jail. Um, they've also held police youth dialogues in which at-risk youth have meetings with officers to help, um, and this is a quote, 
to help break down and understand the behavior of both youth and officers. They discuss similarities and their own hopes and dreams. And this is just one Gainesville Police Department program of several that are aimed at intervening in the lives of at-risk youth or young adults to sort of steer them away from crime without arresting them. Um, and to thereby, getting back to risk, to sort of minimize the risk of a violent or adverse confrontation, right, bet between police and, um, and citizens. <laughs> And I think these are, I think these are admirable uh, and important measures. Um, and they're the sort of thing that helps a community to endorse a novel policing technology like predictive policing, if they see it as being something that police are doing for their benefit um, and not just being imposed on them, right? Um, so um, if, a, if the police in a jurisdiction already have a positive relationship with members of the community, predictive policing will not be seen as a threat and its costs may be seen as worth bearing. Um, one last thing is that um, something else that I think the Gainesville Police Department are doing and that was featured in the Atlantic uh, City Police Initiative is this sort of focus on problem-based or place-based um, uh, policing, which is instead of just allocating more police officers, say on patrol in a neighborhood, you actually identify the underlying geographical drivers of crime in that neighborhood, like abandoned buildings or like dim street lights. Um, and you try to modify those, um, those features of the geography to make crime less attractive to criminals. Okay, that's the thought. Um, and that's a way to sort of reduce crime without increasing um, contact between police and innocent citizens. And that's another way to reduce the risk of, um, uh, of, um, of harmful confrontations between innocent people and police, right? You're not going on patrol, you're changing the features of the area that lead to crime in the first place. Um, and that's it, that's all I got. So hopefully some of that was interesting to you all. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, that, that was a very interesting lecture. I especially appreciated your discussion on uh, the power of prudential exclusion or PPE, which of course, in uh, the COVID era, you know, means something completely different. But um, and I <laughs> yeah, and I couldn't help but think about the parallels of COVID. The people that you know don't want to, you know, do what they're supposed to do. And then I, I noticed uh, Roy Weiner's comment, um, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, but I was curious if um, so the the Pred Paul. Um, so is that how widely is that used, and do we use that? here in Alachua County? I, I'm sorry if I missed that. Uh, uh, no, so um, I am, um, I'm in the process of uh, uh, buttering up the Gainesville Police Department to get a better sense of which, which analytic tools they're using. Um, uh, I did ask them in a meeting if they're using any sort of predictive policing software and they said, uh, yes but they said they use it very judiciously and they don't treat it as gospel. And um, uh, in, a future, in a future meeting, I would like to put in a formal request to get a sort of more thorough briefing about what exactly um, systems they're using. But um, the analytics expert, the officer who's an analytics, analytic ex analytics expert who was describing this to me said, we use the software judiciously because if we used it, treated it, treated it as gospel, we would spend all of our time in the black communities in town, on the east side of town. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, because, and that's a kind of revealing um, uh, as far as um, what these systems might lead to. Yeah. And, and are, what, in your discussions with uh, um, the uh, local police chief, are, are you finding that, um, that people are more or, or less amenable to having, um, some of these mitigations? Are, are you finding people are, are in, in the minority communities pushing back or are, are they actually are welcoming a little bit more uh, police attention? I think that it's, um, now my sense is it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, so um, I don't think there is a single, a single attitude about this. Um, uh, so, you know, 
I mean, this is this is very anecdotal. <laughs> this is very anecdotal. But um, some members of the police advisory council, um, I think, I think about half to two thirds of the members of police of the police advisory council are black, um, and um, a, we have a range of ages. Uh, I think the youngest person on the council is, I want to say, nineteen or twenty, okay. and the oldest person on the council. Well, I won't, I won't guess their age, but they're. Uh, older than I am by a significant margin, right? I mean, uh, you know, um, certainly retirement age, right? And um, I've noticed that the younger members of the council have a slightly different attitude about policing than the older members. That the older members are much more welcoming of additional police presence and are actually very concerned about the vacancies in the police department in, uh, that we have right now. Um, and the younger members are a lot more concerned about not being harassed by police. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's not probably too surprising to hear, but well, let me um, go to the chat here. Um, there's a, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first is um, from uh, Roy Weiner, who says, at, at what level of administrative responsibility do police officers learn what you teach? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so uh, I, I do think that, um, I mean, some of what I teach is a little bit maybe more, um, I don't know. I'm not sure if I gave this presentation to a chief of police, I, I, they might just say like, okay, well, that's all very interesting, but um, look, we have a job to do, right? Um, and so, you know, we're not going to worry too much about these theoretical questions that you're raising, but um, but I do think that uh, at the very least, the the senior leadership in the Gainesville Police Department, my impression is that they are very aware of most of the types of issues that I raise in this presentation. They're very concerned about the about over policing in Black communities. They're over concerned about this the self fulfilling prophecy problem. That predictive policing could give rise to, um, and they seem to take very seriously. And you know, I never gave this presentation to them, but they very they are very very serious about the the role of community members in determining who uh, how they're policed. I am I'm very convinced about that, and I think that's I don't know when. I mean, I've only been on this this police council for a year. I wasn't super involved with the, with law enforcement before that, so I don't know when this change happened. I don't know if it's been a gradual thing, but I think that Chief Jones. Um, is a, is a driving force in that uh, in that initiative. So, I mean, I'm I'm planning a workshop this summer, which will hopefully happen, uh, which is a workshop sort of collaborating, hopefully collaborating with some major police departments in the United States, some academics and some industry folks, designing these systems to sort of talk about um, what the best practices should be for using these big, big data systems uh, in law enforcement and try to kind of come to a consensus about good and bad practices, because right now there really, there really isn't one for domestic law enforcement. It's the wild west, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it really is. <laughs> okay, I have a, another question from uh, Shirley Bloodworth who asks, are we making any progress in diversion programs separating jail and mental health intervention? Um, so, I think yes. Yeah. So there is. Um, uh, so I'm not sure what the police. So do you mean in the city of Gainesville in particular, or uh, sort of nationally? Yeah. Um, um, so I'm not so. I'm not actually sure what's happening um, in the courts with respect to this um, right now. Uh, the only type of diversion program that I'm aware of. Um, now, I'm, I, I know that you're asking specifically about jail versus sort of mental health interventions. Um, one diversion, I mean, the, the only kind of diversion program I'm aware of is the is sort of the, the civil citations program that sort of is trying to uh, not take first time offenders to jail, but rather give them give them a civil citation and um, a court appearance date um, instead of getting them into the, the jail pipeline, if you will. Um, I know that I don't. I haven't heard the details yet, um, but I know that Chief Jones has talked about um, a. Um, I think he calls it. I think the program's called. I just learned about this one community um, program. 
that is going to involve collaborations between law enforcement and mental health experts to work on um, sort of non-law enforcement interventions uh, with people who might need uh, mental health um, uh, counseling. Does uh, predictive policing help in any way to pre-identify the potential for violence because of different reasons? So it, it has been used. So it actually, so, um, so Chicago, the Chicago Police Department, now this is a system that people, I don't think this is, um, speaks to the mental health question, but the Chicago Police Department did have uh, what was called a heat list, um, which was, and you might've read this, read about this in the news, but it was, a, it was basically a, what I would call a person-based predictive policing system um, that was used to identify members of the community that were at especially high risk of either committing or being the victims of violent crime. Um, and uh, they used information about these individuals. I don't think they, I don't think they used mental health history, but they did use things like affiliation, gang affiliation, um, social media activity, recent arrests, um, and things like that to, to actually try to identify high risk individuals. Um, the LAPD used a similar system. It was called the laser program. Um, and, uh, uh, it was, it, was, it was used not in any way to identify people who needed mental health interventions, but to identify the, what I think they called the worst of the worst <laughs> of the community, the, the very high risk um, prevalent offenders and, and figure out ways to sort of extract them from the community. So, but I do know there are now, there is an ongoing collaboration between mental health officials and police in LA to sort of use big data analytics to, to try to identify people in need of mental health interventions. There's a criminologist at UF that has told, that told me about this program and he's in some way, he's some way involved, but he won't answer my emails. And I, I'm <laughs> I was afraid of you. I, yeah. yeah. So I really okay. want to talk with him about this more. But yeah. Okay. So um, uh, Izzy, uh, Shaver, you had your hand up. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions on, and first of all, thanks for such a, thoughtful, mind-provoking discussion. Thanks, yeah. Uh, I have a question on both ends of the spectrum. One is you alluded to, to some extent about uh, not criminalizing some of the minor crimes. At that end, could a, could a police uh, policy be that if you go into a high crime neighborhood or you know these hot spots, to completely ignore some of these minor things like yeah. use of marijuana, just say, forget about it. If you see it, forget about it. Could they do that? Right. And the, the other question at the other end of the spectrum is, regardless of the, the uh, whether it's right or wrong, let's say, but if they go in and clean up a hot spot, what is the probability that that's going to return to a hot spot in the near future? Right, right. Um, yeah, so to answer the first question, uh, I think the answer is yes, they could do that. I mean, so, um, you know, we, we actually just got a presentation about, um, about, the, uh, uh, about, about the recent crime statistics in Gainesville. And one of the statistics that they showed was that um, of all of the drugs that had been confiscated in the city of Gainesville, by far, by like orders of magnitude, the most drugs that were confiscated from people were, was marijuana small amounts of marijuana. Now, um, one of our council members said, wait, why are you guys going around busting people for marijuana? Who cares? Um, what are we doing that for? And the, the chief of police basically said this, look, marijuana possession below, I think it's five grams, um, something like that, is decriminalized. It's, it's an ordinance violation in the city of Gainesville, right? So police are, uh, not taking people to jail for marijuana possession. And as far as I can tell, they aren't um, looking for it. It's not a high priority concern. The sense that I get is that they are enforcing the ordinance in cases where they make a traffic stop and they smell marijuana in the car. And he did say, look, confiscating it doesn't mean that we arrested anyone. It doesn't even mean that we wrote them 
a ticket necessarily, but we can't, we, we have to take it from you if we find it. <laughs> uh, he's like, that's the law. Um, but I, I do think that, yeah, absolutely. I think it's, uh, I mean, the police have a lot of, a lot of leeway in this respect, right? They can prioritize certain crimes over others. Um, and, and I think by not, by not looking for, um, you know, minor drug crimes, uh, this is a way to reduce, uh, reduce the burdens. Um, uh, the other question was um, about, um, what was the other question? I'm sorry. If they, if, if, if they go into a hot spot and they clean it up regardless of the morality, oh. yeah. <clears throat> how long does it remain clean? Yeah, so this is the big problem with, uh, with hot spots policing in general. Um, it's pretty well established that the, uh, that the crime reduction benefits of hot spots policing, where what that means is um, basically putting a cop on the corner, right? Putting police there, increasing police presence in that location. Um, it has the effect of, uh, of reducing crime significantly in that area, but once police leave, it usually returns to its uh, previous level of crime, like within a couple weeks. Um, and I guess this is because, you know, uh, criminals are smart in this way. It doesn't take them that long to learn that, <laughs> that police aren't there anymore. And so um, this is why I think that any sort of successful response to, um, to serious crime has to involve this kind of multi-pronged approach where you don't just increase the, um, the police patrols in an area, you also do things to, um, to change the landscape, right? Why, why is crime, you have to ask, why is crime clustering here? What about, the, what about the neighborhood makes this the place to rob people or to use, you know, to sell drugs or whatever it is, right? Um, and then address that underlying cause. Also, the, you know, the elephant in the room in this conversation is, well, there are even deeper drivers of crime than that, right? The socioeconomic drivers of crime are not the sort of thing that a police force is trained to address, right? Police are not improving the provision of education for all people. They're not um, helping employment prospects. They can't directly help employment prospects for all people. And so, um, you know, to a certain extent, I think that um, uh, law enforcement in general is a band-aid solution to much deeper problems, um, crime problems in the United States. And so it's not surprising that any police solution would be temporary at best. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, Tom, you had one in chat. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure. I, actually, it was two questions. Uh, the, uh, I wondered if anybody besides the Cato Institute has done research uh, into uh, predictive policing, let's use, uh, such as uh, Heritage Foundation or Brookings. And uh, I have uh, some problem with Cato because it was founded by one of the founders was Charles Koch and Tucker Carlson, I believe is a senior fellow. So I'm not sure yeah. that I can think that they're reliably uh, objective about this. And the second question is the opioid epidemic. Yeah, which really moved organized crime out of the cities and into the rural areas, especially West Virginia, rural uh, Kentucky, and rural Virginia. And how would predictive policing be used by law enforcement agencies in those areas to combat the organized crime opioid epidemic? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, here's where I really show my hand. I'm not a statistics guy, so I don't exactly know. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. So, I mean, I guess the question would be, you know, what would that system, what would that kind of predictive policing program look like or something like that, right? Um, and uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, so you're moving, right. So you're moving from the urban to rural, right? On the one hand. Um, I mean, what you're gonna, I suppose it kind of depends on, on what kind of reliable um, data you can actually get about, um, about 
things like drug overdoses uh, in those in those communities, um, uh, and whether you can link those to particular you know distribution networks or things like that. Um, I mean, one problem with moving from urban to rural is just a lack of data points. So, um, you know, one, one interesting feature of predictive policing is that even if, it's, even if you don't have a racially biased system, you could actually end up with a case where you um, end up putting way more resources than is appropriate in certain parts of a city um, because they're more densely populated. So per square mile, you have a lot more information about crime happening in that location than you have in say suburban areas where population is very widely dispersed, right? Um, or in rural, in rural areas. Um, so if you don't have very good uh, fidelity of data in a location, it's hard to make accurate predictions. And so something I would worry about in the rural setting is just, it, you may just not have a sufficient density of data um, uh, to do the kind of uh, the kind of hotspots mapping you would need to do, but I think it would involve collaboration with public health officials or with with medical officials because I would I would suspect that there's there's uh, uh, medical information that's that's relevant in the case of of um, opioid opioid distribution. Um, if you're trying to locate sort of like if you're trying to locate distributors or or organized or members of organized crime. Um, it would also probably involve, you would also probably have to make, I mean, they probably don't have these in rural areas either, but this is where license plate readers can actually be quite useful. Um, if you have reason, if you have reason to suspect a particular vehicle is attached to a particular um, dealer or whatever, um, then you can actually use license plate readers to establish a certain pattern of activity. So if they if they say like pass through these intersections or or they're located in this, you know, they the car parks in this location, you know, with a certain type of regularity, you can get a pattern of activity, um, which might be helpful. Um, but of course that raises constitutional questions that uh, of its own that we might worry about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and did you have a question about uh, Cato? Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just had a comment about some of my colleagues in law enforcement uh, feel that uh, I may be moving into the rural areas because of opioids. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it should be a ripe area for somebody to study with the predictive policing model. I guess right. that was a point I was trying to make. Yeah. And the Cato is just a personal bias I have. I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. Okay. I, yes. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm aware. Not, and I, I feel heritage is. Who I don't agree with, and I feel that Brookings is also uh, objective. And if they've done any work in it, yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, we've exhausted uh, the questions and we've uh, taken up a good amount of uh, Dr. Purvis's time. So I want to say thank you very much for your time with us here today. Um, very good lecture. And, you know, PPE is going to still give me my brain uh, a lot to chew on, you know, the <laughs> supposed. Uh, abused in person's right not to be helped. Um, I guess we'll have to think about that as we're getting frustrated with people that can't wear masks, I suppose, but. Well, I um, wanted to actually answer that very question. Okay. But we'll leave that for some other, from some okay. other time. I, All I right. don't think it justifies anti-masking, but it, we, we could. Yeah. <laughs> it's more of a psychology question, I guess. But, yeah. but anyway, thank you very much for your time here today. Very interesting talk. And uh, I wanna thank everybody for tuning in to the whole series this semester. I, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I look forward to seeing everybody in the spring. Uh, I'm hoping to bring a course on space. So I uh, hope to see you then and everybody enjoy their upcoming holidays. And Paula, we thank you of course for your work setting up this whole series. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right.